first when Serafina invited me to come here, I said, hmm, well, uh, what could I contrib contribute? And I'm not sure this is exactly where I should be. And he said that one area of interest that, that he had and that he thought should be represented in this conference was the intersection of linguistic research with language revitalization and language teaching. So uh, here I am. The, uh, what, I, what I mostly do is grammar, and I've uh, worked also in language politics, as John pointed out, and in both um, linguistics and in anthropology. But the principal question I set myself for this talk was whether linguistic research has been or can be useful to programs of language revitalization or language teaching. It seems to me to be quite clear that linguistics and linguistic research are not sufficient preparation for successful programs in these areas. But it also seems to me that linguistic research is, in fact, crucially important uh, in both of the enterprises, specifically in the area of grammar. In other words, it's not enough, but it is probably necessary. We might um, ask how much grammar is really necessary for language revitalization or language teaching. And it's clear that some people have said none, and other people have said a lot, and you know, I stand on it. It's, it's necessary. Why? Well, the way in which either enterprise is presently conceived, grammar plays an important role. Both language revitalization and language teaching are accomplished in part through schooling or other formal educational programs. And such programs always involve at least some study of grammar. I think few would question that teaching grammar is part of language teaching. All language programs we are aware of in either um, schools, high schools, or lower schools, or universities include some study of grammar. Although it is a little less <coughs> obvious why revitalization programs should do so, I think there are good reasons why grammar is and should be a part of revitalization as well. One of the several constantly repeated pejorative characterizations of indigenous languages is that they have no grammar. The proof of this, proof in, of course, uh, in, in quote marks, is that on occasion is taken to be the lack of a written grammar of a particular language. One of the immediate goals of language revitalization programs is always to kind of dispel these sorts of misperceptions of what like indigenous languages might have. So grammar soon comes to take an, a central and unquestioned role in the teaching programs that are designed to uh, promote revitalization because the first thing you have to do is show that your language is as good as anybody else's language, which means that it has a grammar. So whether we need grammar or not to revitalize, we need grammar to for a proper public presentation of a language. And that's part of um, its, its reputation. It's part of its identity. Having written grammars of a language is important, and teaching grammar to speakers of languages is equally important. So they become consciously aware of the fact that their languages have the same attributes as does Spanish. Teaching grammar to speakers also is part of the process of language standardization, which often is a part of language revitalization. So there are a number of different reasons why grammar becomes part of uh, revitalization projects. So what linguists do is study grammar. Um, many of us write grammars as a result of those studies. And what we can contribute is doing research on grammar, writing about grammar, and teaching grammar. And that's where I think then that the, there's a main intersection between linguistics and programs of either revitalization or language teaching. What I'd like to do with the rest of this, of my time here, is show how, um, or examine how one area of Mayan grammar, specifically the grammar of Mam, one of the Mayan languages, um, show how linguistic research in this area has furthered our understanding of that part of the grammar. Attempts to teach the grammar of the language without the insights that linguistics provides have been, by and large, inadequate. 
The area of grammar that I want to look at here is the system for expressing time and aspect in Ma. Up until quite recently, Mom and other Mayan languages were typically characterized, um, although usually not by linguists, as having present, past, and future tenses. If one's grammatical tradition comes from a European language, it is usual to think of languages as having tense systems, in which most clauses have one of a set of obligatory markers of grammatical tense or time in relation to some point of reference, such as the moment of speaking. The basic categories for the expression of time or tense are present, past, and future, although specific languages may have more complex systems. However, some languages, and Mayan languages are among them, mark aspect rather than tense. Aspect gives information about the internal temporal structure of an event rather than locating it in time relative to some other moment. And so aspectual information thus most often has to do with the beginning or completion of an event or with how it progresses. Mom has four principal aspects marked through a set of six morphemes that are preposed to the verb. They indicate the completive or perfective, the incompletive or imperfective, the potential, and what I'm calling the proximate. In addition, Ma, Ma marks mood through suffixes on the verb and here distinguishes between irrealis, which includes potential and imperative, and that's marked with a suffix, and realis, which is everything else and it has no suffix. Uh, negative markers and temporal subordinators, the temporal subordinators are the when uh, words in when clauses, also contribute to the expression of the difference between the realis and irrealis moods. Temporal information, besides being given by temporal adverbs, is inferred from the aspect and mood markers, so it's not directly marked. So what can we conclude from all of these? Well, mom is not a tense language. It does not mark tense, if you think of tense as being the, um, the obligatory marking of time in each clause of the language, or even the just in general, the marking of time predominantly in the clauses. The, um, in fact, there really is none, are none of these markers that you can say are really time although they do have default temporal readings. So you can infer time from the markers and also you get time from other parts of the texts, like specific adverbs and things like sequencing and the uses of conjunctions and uses of um, the perfect to show temporal inversion and other things like that. So although it's not a tense language, the temporal context is adequately and in fact abundantly indicated. Some of the temporal interpretations depend on a subtle reading of the aspectual information. For instance, the use of the proximate aspect to indicate events that are consequent on other events. It seems to me is quite subtle. It's quite um, certainly from the perspective of somebody who speaks a European language, it seems very subtle, because we don't do anything like that. It seems hard. Um, but it, 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 it does give you a kind of um, dependency and sequencing that tells you a good deal about time. And then it further seems to me that if you describe Mom or any other Mayan language as a tense language, that you're basically not doing justice to the data. And you fail to show quite a lot of complexity. So that's what I've tried to show right now with all of this big bunch of data, is that there is a lot of complexity in the way in which Mayan languages, Mom in this case, indicate time, and that it's, it's, it's necessarily going to be, there's going to be a lot of complexity because it doesn't have a simple grammatical formula for indicating time. So languages that have tense, we don't have as much problem with, with time because we've got the tense markers. Um, and, but languages that don't have tense, that have aspect, you have to, you, you get a lot of other information through the aspect markers, but then you need to um, have a fairly, or possibly a, a fairly complex system for actually getting at time. And I think um, that I've shown that, that mom has that. 
um, and it's, you get an interplay among aspect, mood, and time that, that, that allow you to locate anything temporally, and not just by the use of adverbs, which will always do it exactly. In fact, the use of temporal adverbs isn't particularly high in this language. You might think, oh well, but you know, just add an adverb, you can straighten it all out. Well, they don't have to, and they don't. And so when I go through my text and try to count up adverbs and see what they're doing, I don't find very many, not temporal adverbs anyway. And so then, finally, um, linguists, I think, can help discover these kinds of complexities in the grammatical categories that indigenous languages contain. And through that, we can contribute to the recognition of these languages as bearers of very rich traditional, uh, of grammatical traditions of their own. And they're not simply poor or little understood copies of the grammatical traditions of other languages. So part of teaching grammar is, I think, to teach it right. And part of revitalizing the language is to recognize what, in fact, the language um, has that make it a, a rich expressive system. And I, what I'm trying to convince you of is that the aspect system in Mount is a rich expressive system and it's not covered by past, present, and future. It has, and that's what I hope linguistics can add to the teaching of languages and to language revitalization. Thank you.